Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the Hive Think Tank webinar series. My name is Olivia, I'm the operations manager at the Hive in Silicon Valley, and we're super excited to have you join us to hear from our expert panel speakers from SAP, Rockset, and Salesforce. So with that being said, I'm going to quickly go over some of today's best practices for the webinar and share what the Hive Think Tank does, and then I'll pass it over to Ravi, who's the Hive's founder and managing director, and he'll also be moderating today's session. So we do love questions, so we'd love for the audience to utilize the Q&A button and not the general chat box at the bottom of your screen to ask our presenters any questions, um, which we'll, they'll get through um, throughout the event. And then the session is also being recorded, so feel free to check it out um, later on our YouTube channel. So the Hive Think Tank is an ecosystem of thought leaders, corporations, and entrepreneurs. We're an event and content um, platform that focuses on AI, cybersecurity, future work, fintech, and so much more. So we do host events almost every other week on different uh, topics and technology and business. So we'd love for the audience to join our meetup group and newsletter, and I'll link that in the chat box later on um, after this, just to stay up to date on some of our events. Um, and we'll, Ravi will also be sharing some more details about our, the upcoming Hive events. Lastly, I do wanna thank our sponsors, Avanta Ventures and Gamuda for their support. And if anything, if anyone is interested in getting involved with the Hive Think Tank, feel free to reach out to me directly and make sure to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. So with that being said, let me go ahead and pass it over to Robbie. Thank, thank you, Olivia, and thank you for uh, hosting today's event. If we go to the next slide, a brief introduction about The Hive. The Hive is an early stage uh, venture capital fund, and, and we've been around since 2012, um, and the focus since then has been around data and AI. And, and in addition to sort of models, tools, uh, data management, we focus on um, the enterprise uh, SaaS space, on, on the vertical SaaS space, especially life sciences and industrials uh, with some fintech and, and in cybersecurity. In addition to the entity we have in um, Palo Alto in the U covering kind of the US, we have separate entities in Brazil, uh, Southeast Asia based in Malaysia, India, and coming very soon in, in Europe. So if you're an entrepreneur interested in uh, generative AI or cybersecurity or the applications, we'd love to hear from you. Next slide, please. Um, we have two series of events going on today. Of course, we have an event on generative AI. Um, and we have an, uh, an, another series on the future of work that is starting in the fall. You'll also see a whole security um, uh, uh, set of events starting in the fall. Next slide, please. Um, uh, please do check out my colleague Kamesh Raghavendra's uh, blog, recent blog, on, on kind of generative AI in the enterprise. And, and Olivia will share a link with you. Um, coming up is uh, uh, is an event uh, with the leaders of um, remote work solutions from VMware, Citrix, Sonnet, moderated by Goldman Sachs, on on kind of the new and emerging solutions for the future of work. Uh, I hope you can join us on September thirteenth. Following that, um, Olivia is is uh, is an event with. CISOs and CIOs, uh, more or less on the same topic, but really covering kind of the changing nature of work, whether it's gig work, uh, of course, hybrid work, um, uh, uh, AI assisted work, uh, uh, and kind of the new tools and new requirements and new tools needed. And that event will be moderated by the CISO of Forge Rock, Russ Kirby. Um, next slide, please. Um, following that, we have an AI, a generative AI um, uh, talk, and this is around uh, security, uh, model security, and other sort of uh, security uh, related to AI by all the leaders in this space. And that will be moderated by our sister entity and my colleague, Jed, 
from March Capital. Um, and and uh, watch this space for an event that's coming up um, on the future of work, which we are co-hosting with, with SAP and uh, my good friend here, Yad. And this will be actually a hybrid event. It will be an in-person and a Zoom event. So with that, uh, we'd like to get this uh, event started. And, and so what an exciting time we live in the last six, seven, eight months. And, and so I'll, I'll start maybe in order here and ask each of the panelists to sort of introduce themselves, give us a little bit their vision of, um, of uh, how they or are, are their company views generative AI and, and feel free to talk about any kind of product offerings you have. Shall we start with you, Yad? Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Ravi. It's great uh, being with the Hive again. And hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Yad Oren. I've been with SAP for almost 18 years. Um, I have two roles in SAP. One of them, I'm the managing director of SAP Labs in the US, where we oversee the 6,000 developers we have in the US, right? As you may know, SAP is a European company. We have around 6,000 women and men building products here in the US, especially around innovation and cloud technologies. And beside um, being the managing director, I'm also the global head of SAP Innovation Center Network. This is a global R&D group, which is tasked to build the next big thing for SAP and, and kind of shape the next generation of enterprise software. So of course, a lot of emerging technologies come into the mix leveraging AI and other technologies, blockchain, I have a team of quantum computing and so forth. Many interesting things to discuss. Of course, today we're gonna to focus on generative AI. And just in two lines about, uh, Ravi, what you asked about um, our AI strategy, I'm sure we're going to elaborate more um, um, later in this, in this panel. We are uh, mostly doing two things. As you know, we are um, the leading enterprise application company and we are working on embedding AI in all the different applications that we have, from finance to solution manager, uh, to supply chain, to customer experience, employee experience, and so forth. We are working about on more than 130 um, use case where you use AI to automate for analytics and other things we can discuss later. And the second thing we are doing, we're also a platform company. We have the business technology platform where we provide a lot of tools to customers, to partners, to extend the offering we provide with the application, but also to build their own reliable and relevant um, application that have generative AI inside of them. So that's about me in a nutshell and what we do. And again, happy to be here. Hey, thank you, Yad. Shruti? Thank you, Ravi, so much for having me here. Uh, and really like great work the Hive's doing, um, you know, hosting these panels. My name is Shruti Bhart. I am Chief Product Officer at Rockset, um, one of the founding team members being here from the beginning. And Rockset, for those of you who are not familiar, is a search and analytics database. Uh, the exciting news is just today we announced that we've raised another 44 million in funding, brings our total up to 105 million. And this is primarily to redefine the future of search and analytics for the era of AI. Turns out uh, what we've been doing from the beginning has been indexing, so we index all your data. And as it turns out, in the age of AI, everybody's generating vector embeddings and you need to store, index, and query these vector embeddings. So that's the new feature that Rockset has added, which makes us also one of the you know, most um, scalable hybrid vector databases out there because now we can index all your enterprise data as well as index vector embeddings to give you, um, you know, really scalable search and AI applications. So that's what uh, Roxa does in a nutshell. My role there is I run product management, design, and all things marketing, and really excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, Shruti, maybe if if I can just jump in with a, a question, if you can help um, uh, educate the audience. Um, how, uh, if you can kind of chat, uh, talk a little bit about how uh, uh, embeddings, vector databases, embeddings, kind of help in 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 the uh, LLM approach and and how it reduces costs, reduces uh, hallucinations, improves accuracy. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, most of you are probably familiar with all the LLMs and the, you know, the way vector embeddings are being generated today. So you take your enterprise data, pass them through these models, and then you generate vector embeddings. Now, what do you do once you have these vector embeddings is where it gets very interesting. So you've taken all your unstructured data, right? Text, images, um, you know, any sort of unstructured data that's lying around. You take these vector embeddings, pass them through a vector database so that you can start indexing all of your vector embeddings. The minute it's being indexed, you can start doing things like similarity searches. I'll give you a very real world example that you can all relate to. Imagine you're on your favorite dating app and you know as you're trying to you know swipe left swipe right it has to do the best matches for you based on you know your preferences and what you've swiped on however it's not enough if it's only doing similarity searches so vector search typically tends to be a similarity search it's trying to find the nearest neighbors similar to what you liked before however imagine in this dating app there are two real time signals that it really needs to incorporate. And those tend to be, have you been online recently? Like if you're currently online, that means the match is much more likely to be successful. And the second is, are the two of you within the same geographic location right now? Because that means it's much more likely to be successful. So this is where it gets interesting because enterprises find that Yes, you create, you use LLMs, create your vector embeddings, start doing vector search and similarity searches. But where it gets interesting is how do you use the metadata you already have, like location information, like who's online right now, and use all these real-time signals when you are building your app for online inference. And that is where you know vector databases play a huge role. And this is again, you know, rock set sweet spot is that we have a massive streaming engine. We can incorporate all these real time signals. So it's very exciting to see, you know, generative AI now coming to all the enterprises with vector databases, search and analytics databases like rock set. Thank you, Shruti. Uh, Gary? Hey everyone, this is Gary. I'm happy to, to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, so I'm working at Salesforce. I've been doing a couple of things. So a while ago, I was working on field service, which has some things to do with AI because there is an optimization engine and so on. But all in all, that was before. And then like one year and a half ago, I got asked to work on the emerging technologies and products. And at that time, it was all about Web3. So uh, I got asked to be to, to see what would be the enterprise response for, for Web3. In the meantime, uh, starting... January this year, everybody moved from Web3 to AI. That was a new big shiny stuff. So now I'm doing both of them. Uh, and I'm working now on AI as well. Um, the strategy for Salesforce, and, and today I'll, I'll basically my, the opinion I will express will be my own, but just to explain a little bit what uh, Salesforce is, is uh, seeing in the market. What we see is that literally every single um, cloud at Salesforce, we have sales cloud, service cloud, and so on. Um, each of the persona need help from AI uh, assistance. So you see the kind of copilot Microsoft is also releasing and so on. This is really a direction we are taking as well. Plus we see a big need for trust. Um, people are wondering if they can trust OpenAI, can they send the data, what's happening with the data, uh, how is it used for training and so on. OpenAI just released an enterprise version of, uh, of their solution yesterday, I think, or two days ago. Um, but that's something we, we see coming back from customers is really like, what's going to happen with my data? Um, as much as if my employee use this to be better at their job uh, and more productive, as much as, hey, can I trust the AI to speak to my customer and not end up with a big PR issue or whatever? So that's, I think, what we are coming with uh, because trust is number one at Salesforce. And that's what we have been pushing for quite a while. Um, also, you know, the, with all the LLM and, and, and GPT trends coming, um, it's been funny because we have been working on AI for years. I think it's just accelerating a lot and changing the interfaces, changing what's feasible as well compared to uh, what was feasible a few years ago only. So yeah, that's what we see uh, right now on the market. Great. Thank, thank, thank you, Gary. So may, maybe we'll we'll jump in. If you if you 
think about kind of three broad areas um, in generative AI. One is around sort of the the training and the and the serving uh, uh, infrastructure, which is primarily dominated by Nvidia and the and the and the hyperscalers. The second around kind of LLMs, tooling, vector databases, data management, middleware. You know, that's the whole second category. The third being kind of applications. Uh, where do you see sort of your company primarily playing? That's the first question. Second is for um, startups in particular, but other software vendors also, where do you see sort of the the big open challenges and problems? Um, should we start with, with you, Yad? Oh, yeah, of course. I think for SAP, we, have, we are definitely playing in the third layer, the application layer where we have um, an open ecosystem approach. We actually use um, multiple LLM models and vendors. Some of them are closed. Some of them are open. You know, SAP was also last month announced its investment in Anthropsy and Coheres. We have strategic partnership with Microsoft and, and, and that we announced last uh, June in our Sephir conference. So we are having an open approach to using these lower levels that you mentioned, Ravi, and build application. We do we do also do some work which is down the stack. Um, we're not going into you know Nvidia territory and others, but we are looking to build some um, advanced grounding models or, or or LLM just for specific use case. But definitely the work is on the application. And this is where we also have more than half a million enterprise customers, right? So this is um, already um, a very big uh, target audience for us. I think for startup is a very interesting uh, question, Ravi, and I can divide it into two. I think like any technology revolution out there, when it comes to the core technology itself, to what we call the, the gold rush, right? Building the LLM, the models, we're going to see very few winners and many, many losers. I think we've been there with any technology transformation. Ravi, in the past, we had some, you know, Hadoop Spark discussion. You know, we had so many companies and, you know, some fall, some of them, few of them are there. And then Kubernetes, Mesosphere, remember what will be the next project. So it always, the gold rush always leads to, if you're aiming to this uh, core topic, this is where, in my humble opinion, the a lot of open source models will prevail and also few winners will emerge. It's a lot of work to build the models and the, the accuracy. But the, for startups, I like a lot the investment strategy called picks and shovels, right? Like if you have the gold rush, look for the shovels to that help, you know, because the only people who made money in the gold rush in the beginning of the 20th century in San Francisco were the one that sold shovels, right? So everything around the data quality, everything around, you know, um, reduction of, of cost, everything around, for example, having um, some interfaces to the uh, uh, models. Another area that can really help building, like the ecosystem around the models, I think this is where there is oceans of opportunity for startups. And this is where, um, yeah, I, I think uh, we're going to see many more innovation coming. Ruti? So um, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, I already said we play in the, the vector database space. Um, Rockset is a search and analytics database. We index all the enterprise data for search and analytics. And now we also index vector embeddings as they're generated. But very much um, like what um, Yad said, I think what we're really seeing is that just like SAP is now looking at multiple LLMs, most of our customers are also doing the same thing. They're looking at all these different models, some um, custom, some open source. And the biggest challenge that we see that we think um, a lot of uh, you know new startup innovation is going to happen is how do you orchestrate, how do you manage all of this? especially for enterprises that have massive scale. You have a lot of enterprise data, just orchestrating that has been hard enough. Now you have all these you know, new models 
constantly emerging. You have to try when you have, you know, another big model announced, you want to try that, or your internal team has been building some, you know, training some models. Now, suddenly the challenge becomes, how do you orchestrate so that all of your metadata, your enterprise data is being managed as well as the new models that you want to use are all being integrated. And, you know, in the past, we've seen companies like Fivetran coming in for ELT, companies like DBT coming in um, when Snowflake and, uh, you know, Redshift were becoming popular. Now, the question is, what is the equivalent for operationalizing all of this? And that I still see as a huge challenge. So Rockset, for example, you know, a lot of our customers, what we see is the biggest struggle tends to be around real-time updates. It's not enough for me to just you know, deploy this model in production. If I'm really going to update at scale, I need to handle real-time updates as and when they come in. You know, we've handled this through streaming ingestion and by doing updates in place. But even then, like our customers are now coming to us, can you also handle you know, not just take vector embeddings that we've generated, but actually take the data for us and generate the vector embeddings by calling out to some of the other uh, models that we want to use. These are the kind of workflows that I still see enterprises struggling with. And I think there's a huge opportunity for startups to come and help solve this because no matter which model ends up being the winner, whether it's an open source, whether it's you know enterprises using custom models, invariably they have to orchestrate all of this and managing this is no, not a trivial task at scale. Got it. Gary? Yeah, so on our side, I think we are playing as well in the in the third layer of so application and, and use cases. Um, I think what, what we are doing, generally speaking, is we always build a platform first. So we make it easy, declarative, you know, uh, click not code and so on. So that's the first thing we will do. With that, once we have this, we are building more use cases. And that's what you see now. If it was like, we changed the name 50 times, but it was called sales GPT, service GPT, and so on. And I think the name is going to change uh, still uh, over and over. Einstein GPT. Um, yeah. Einstein GPT, we had as well. Um, Are you so, asking we'll Chat GPT to generate these names for you? <laughs> no, we didn't ask Chat GPT. We, we should ask. Um, but so all in all, yeah. So we have the platform and then we have the, the use case that are going to be built. Um, we also see ourselves like, what customers have been asking and like from Salesforce is that we integrate with many, many, many other solutions. And I think even for LLMs, that's going to be the same. Um, we need to integrate with OpenAI, with Cohere, with Entropic, with whoever. Like we, little by little, you'll see that uh, customers will ask us. Maybe we'll support one supplier more than another, but all in all, keep it open, open APIs, you know, making sure that customers can integrate what they want. Um, so that's where we we, we are playing. More and more will deliver use case, but I think for startups, um, they can go even further in the use case. Like we will deliver a use case for sales, for service and so on. But then there is further very, very targeted niche use case that I think we cannot afford to invest in every single little thing that customers are thinking. We have more than uh, you know 200,000 customers. And so all of them have different use cases that are ex exactly like very different in terms of exactly how they are going to do it. So being very targeted to one workflow for one use case, for one industry, I think that's where the startups can really differentiate, especially if they bring either the database or the tool to build a database faster to train uh, the model. So what I mean by this is come with your expertise. Like if you know very well healthcare, come and build something that is dedicated for a very niche use case in healthcare and uh, in a, um, for call center or for whatever else. So I think that's what startup can build much more than us because we will have to build something that's work for that's working like 80% of the time for everyone, but we cannot do the like full customization for super specific use case. So that's one. The second thing is compliance as well. Um, there will be more and more companies asking you to be compliant with in the healthcare business with different uh, laws and regulation different uh, continents need different uh, regulation as well so that i think is a place where we will be you know compliant with many many things like we are already uh, at salesforce but there is always new things popping up where startups can be hey you know what if you want to do this very specific use case in france or in belgium or wherever where the law is a bit different we are compliant with that law as well that's actually high value for companies um and then the last piece for me is 
we will build tools, um, so use them. Like at Salesforce, you can always build on top of it. So the startups can build and use our tools, use our features and add more features on top of the product itself. So that I think is, generally speaking, very valuable as well for brands is to say, hey, not only you can use what Salesforce is providing out of the box, but on top of this, we added 20 features that do this, this, and this on top of the existing product. So that I think where, uh, where startups can play. And um, maybe the last piece is right now, make it easy for setting it up, quick wins, don't go for changing everything at the company. It's enterprise, they need quick wins, they need something that is deployed in super fast, like a few months only maximum, show the, the value and then move on. Like don't try to say, hey, I'm going to come and change every single workflow at your company. It's going to take 24 months and then you'll see uh, some value that will never work. Right now, people want like, hey, I'm trying this. I don't know exactly what's going to happen if I use this AI on this data or this data. Can I get a quick win in one, two months? And then we'll be ready for to pay for what you are offering. But right, right now I see all the companies are looking for, I don't want to miss out on the AI opportunity. I, I want to participate in this, but I want to demonstrate as well that if we spend budget, we get a, a, a ROI that is pretty uh, quick. Pretty any examples you you can give us on on use cases, um, applications or use cases driven by generative AI, especially I think with a with a kind of a revenue lens. I think I think we see a lot of use cases. Um, uh, Yad mentioned a few, uh, you know, where efficiency and productivity of people, um, so kind of cost oriented. Uh, co-pilot type uh, use cases, but any thoughts on on new products, new revenue type use cases? Yeah, I think the biggest one we're seeing um, is around recommendations. So being able to do more recommendations and personalization is a direct revenue generating opportunity. In fact, one of our customers, um, Whatnot, I don't know if you folks have heard of them, uh, growing incredibly fast, uh, you know, one of the more modern e-commerce platforms with live auctions. And this is how they're completely changing the game. You get into the platform, they have a bunch of live auctions going on, and they immediately figure out which live auctions to send you to. And they're recommending the right auctions for you in the moment. And all of this is done using AI. And where does generative AI play a role in these kind of you know, recommendations engines? Again, you can always see you know, any marketplace. If you want to add new products in the past, you had to have somebody go and tag those products and tell you what it's about, right? So somebody had to tell you, this is a shoe, this is white. And th that kind of tagging is first of all, very manual and you know, not super accurate, but with generative AI now, you can have, you know, almost imagine an AI bot that's looking at all the images, looking at the video, looking at the text and inferring what this is about and then making the right recommendations. And again, for retail companies, especially marketplaces, uh, social um, platforms, it's a direct revenue generator. So we're seeing recommendations show up as one of the top revenue generating use cases. Even, I mean, as a you know, search and analytics engine, as a vector database, that is our most popular use case. Again, going back to Gary's point, most customers are currently looking for those quick wins and recommendations, improving recommendations. Again, think about it. Almost every company has invested in some sort of personalization, some sort of recommendation. So it's very easy to take that baseline, add AI to it, show that I've improved by this much, improved the baseline by this much. So you can do a quick experiment, prove it out, show the revenue increasing as you've done your experiment and make a case for investing more. So I 100% agree with Gary. You want to look for these kind of quick wins where you're not starting with a brand new use case. You already have been attempting some personalization, some recommendation. Now bring AI into the mix improve your ROI. I think that is the number one thing. Yeah, I think Marvin, maybe I can build on this. I think it's a it's a great point, Rudy, because also maybe a humble advice to start up, because what we observe, it's very easy to become, you know, very sexy with generative AI. And enterprises looking for something I will be even a little bit bold, say boring and relevant and trusted, right? Um, and the use case that we observe are far away at the moment where, where they have huge economical value and benefit. 
are not the you know uh, jumping avatar and self thing that a gen AI can provide the automated human and other thing we're seeing, which is a great thing to explore. But really, some, there's so much value in just reading documentation and help to implement software or coming to a recommendation. Um, and there are so much, uh, we released uh, in Alpha an assistant for support and service and salesperson to help better know your customers. One of the things which is very important, might be very boring, but super critical, mission critical for companies is compliance. When there is so much work need to be done, if you're now a construction company, let's say in the US, you want to expand into Europe, now you need to, from regularity, reg from regulation point of view, kind of match your, um, let's say, sustainability criteria to the EU terminology. So if you build a house and you have a window and this window needs to have some sort of energy efficient grade, you need to map it into, you know, the EU uh, window is kind of a construction material asset. You need to map this kind of thing into other. This is something that might sound boring, but the work needs to be done in, 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 to do this. And now can be done with uh, LLM is super, super impactful and also reduce the error rate because if human is doing an error here, it's compliance, it's market expansion, it cannot become any more mission critical for enterprises. So the, the message is really the more down to earth, relevant, reliable, and, and you know, um, and, and I would say a responsible use case to also get the IT and organization trust is something we're going to see, I think, for the next few years. And then those sexy things will follow, but we need to have a wedge into the enterprise with those use cases first. By boring, you mean bread and butter, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, going over documentation and recommendation, it's it's something which is very impactful. And I can quant we can quantify the ROI. The CFO yeah. will like it, right? The CEO will like it because you see the money. But there are so many great use cases about, you know, also in the consumer market, right? About really uh, self-autonomous uh, enterprises and other things and, and self, you know, and gaming and others, which is good. But at the moment, yeah, it's definitely bread and butters and seeing which are, go go where the business output is, where you can quantify the ROI, where you can quantify productivity gain, reduction of cost, reduction of risk, something that you know the business value will be there. And then more use case, more opportunity will unfold. And as there is trust in the technology. In fact, I would take it even a step further and say not all internal use cases are necessarily only about efficiency. So customer service is a great example. If you can provide a delightful customer experience when they really need that, I'll use one of, one of our customers, um, JetBlue, as an example, because they were featured in the Databricks um, keynote even. But it's amazing. Um, you know, imagine when you, in the moment, really need to update your flights because, you know, holiday travel, weather's really harsh and everything's getting grounded, trying to call multiple airlines, you're on hold. But at that moment, if JetBlue gives you a chatbot that is a delightful experience that is completely relevant, knows the weather, knows what's happening, has the latest flight information, can rebook you without any hassle, that is again, immediate revenue generating and increases customer loyalty and you know, going back to trust, right? Suddenly you trust that airline because they got your back when things are hard. So that's the kind of stuff we see. It's not necessarily internal efficiencies, even something like customer service can turn into customer loyalty, revenue generating, and much more longer term relationships with customers. Yeah, and to build on that, and I fully agree with that. And I think in general, what I'm, I'm seeing, it's nearly a mental shift that companies need to do, but right now, Everybody is looking at hey, how can I use AI to reduce costs and can I reduce the number of people working for me or whatever. And it's not really actually that that they should think of is maybe it's because of the economic uh, pressure right now that everybody is thinking cost cutting. But in fact, you, know, you should think about how can I generate more revenue with this. Uh, there is really huge opportunities in generating more revenue. And a simple like um, discussion I had with um, a good friend of mine that is financial advisor. And he's not even using Salesforce. I'm just asking him, hey, did, did you use uh, ChatGPT? And he's, he's telling me, yeah, I used it a couple of times and I started to use it for my job as well. Um, and what he was using it for was mainly to give like uh, explanation about complex uh, financial instruments and so on. So he was looking for this and putting that in an email or whatever. 
But then he, he gained a lot of time with this. And he was telling me like, now I can do many more things that I where I have much more high value and that are going to be bring much more value for my customers and for myself as well, like finding the best stocks uh, and so on and so on, where he, he didn't spend that much time because he had to answer to these kind of questions. So I think there is the story of like, yes, you can reduce time spent somewhere, but now that you gain time, where do you, how and where do you use that time to actually make revenue? Um, so it's not a matter of decreasing, like getting rid of that person and decreasing cost. It's a matter of like getting them to be much more productive to bring revenue. And I think that's really, really important to keep in mind when you are building a, a solution is tell the company what they can do more with what you're offering. So if you reduce there, the amount of time spent on this task, do you have a tool? Do you have another solution? Do you have something that they can use to generate revenue? And then you come with... Not only we are decreasing a little bit the cost, but we are increasing the revenue. That actually is very, very valuable for uh, a company. Switching gears, I'm going to take a question from Mark, our good friend who we haven't seen in a long time, Mark uh, Wolfart. So, so he's asking about something that was mentioned by Yad earlier about open versus closed LLM. So I'll, I'll kind of maybe para uh, kind of rephrase it. Um, if you think about sort of the three approaches, one is the foundational type or uh, enterprise friendly foundational uh, closed uh, LLMs. The second category is sort of the pre-trained like Lama 2 and, and the things from Hugging Face and so forth. And the third is sort of the open source ones where um, company will use fine tuning and vector embeddings and so forth to 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 kind of get going um any any thoughts maybe we'll start with uh, with you gary any thoughts on which uh, uh, how this is all going to settle who's going to use what what are the yeah. issues first i'm going to it's an article i'm i'm not really agreeing with that article but i'm still going to put the link there uh, from uh, wired and it's about like the meat of, of open source AI. Um, what they, they say there is, even if you look at Llama 2, um, supposed to be open source and so on, but then there is, way, there is ways you can use it and ways you can't use it. Uh, and also you don't exactly know what's the database behind, like how, is, how it got trained and so on. So it's not as open as, um, as you would think. It's not very transparent. Nevertheless, I think there is really a world where both exist. Um, open source is key to uh, to actually make the the technology a bit more uh, democratized. And also, I think there is a big risk of having two three companies holding literally the most important technology that's happening that's building being built right now. So I think it's extremely important to push for that open source. Uh, but don't you see a kind of a cost problem? You know, given. GPT four was more than hundred million dollar investment. Yeah. Five six will start approaching the billion dollar mark. Correct. And and if if a company is how much is enterprise IT going to spend on on an LLM? So if it's a few million dollars, it's just going to be you know the results are going to be dramatically different. I think it's going to be dramatically different, but maybe you don't need such a huge model for the target use case you, you want to achieve. So it's back to right now, even if you look at GPT-4, I'm asking GPT-4 for recipe for my five weeks uh, dinner that with my kids. I'm asking like, can I get healthy food for my kid that would match my kids and uh, my taste? And I'm asking GPT-4. Honestly, do I really need GPT-4 for that? Probably not. So I think it's the same story. It's like, that's a, a simple analogy, but it's just like, if your startup is doing something super targeted, you don't have to go in a huge like LLM that's costing a fortune. Maybe you go a bit smaller, but very, very much dedicated for that niche use case. And I think that's something you will see as well. A little bit like in the car industry, you have some engines that can, that can do everything. And then there is some engine that are very dedicated, maybe smaller, but very dedica dedicated to something. And that's actually still very valuable and that's costing much less to actually build. So I think that's what you will see. And then open and close, I think both need to to uh, to exist. Open source will be, I think, tough to they will have a tough time to compete with, you know, getting the talent, getting the people to work on it. Um, but I think it's key that we push for open source. 
I have a very different take on this, by the way. I think um, we've seen this in even open source software, open source databases, and really you know, more and more companies are now changing their open source licenses as the world evolves. And you know, HashiCorp recently did this. Everybody's you know, looking at what does this really mean? And the way uh, the industry is evolving, especially in AI, unless like all the data itself that was used to train it is open, unless you have a lot of you know, openness in exactly how you're controlling how the model is being trained, well, you don't. It's going to just end up being the same thing where well, yeah, you say it's open, but really it's not really that open at the end of the day, once customers start using it, and once you have to you know generate value out of it, all of the you know models are you know subject to change, right? So tomorrow, just like somebody went and changed their open source license, tomorrow these um you know the the big tech companies behind open sourcing these LLMs, whether it's Meta or anybody else, can go change their mind and say we're going to start monetizing this, especially when you know you don't have access to the data, you don't have access to how this is being trained. Is open source really open in this context? What you really want as an enterprise is the ability to leverage these. And the way I see this evolving over time is yes, in the beginning it's great for experimentation, right? The more open open source openness, but once you go into production. I don't see that um, being the big game changer for enterprises. I think they're all going to leverage things like, you know, going back to OpenAI just announced their enterprise chat GPT. They're going to work very closely with the enterprises to help them use it at enterprise scale, give them the security, give them what they need. Or even like, you know, this is the approach that vector databases like ourselves are taking where we're saying, we will work with you to make it enterprise grade. But I really see that's the direction this is going to go, not so much open source models winning, quote unquote. And, and to that point, um, we hosted a bunch of uh, CIOs who spoke about their adoption of enterprise AI. And if you are a significant Microsoft customer, um, it's a pretty easy direction for you in, in the case of kind of their version of the, uh, you know, uh, Azure open AI. So uh, Yad, I know you you wanted to say something. Yeah, no, I, I think there is. Um, I agree, um, Shruti, with with what you say. Uh, there is a, a, another question about how relevant can be the model for your business need, um, and and also the question of cost. And it's a trade off because if you now, so like I said, we are using the open source the existing models where it can help us to solve the business problem we need. But we can also not ignore if you saw Stanford and Berkeley research recently, ChatGPT accuracy is actually going down and others. So we need to tackle a few things. But if you take now, for example, a reason to build a whole new closed foundational model or an LLM, let's say for order to cache, a big use case where you stream on the data and you want to help the entire process of manufacturing a product and ship it and sell it. Just to do with existing model, the amount, and maybe I'm getting a little bit geeky here, but the amount of grounding technologies and other, just to tilt the word, you know, delay, that it won't be delay with flight or delay to a meeting by delay related to shipment, delay related to SLA or vendor, the amount of grounding and fine tuning you need to do to existing model can be very costly and error prone as well. So if you, a little bit, Gary, like you said, if you have a good, big enough problem, to justify even to build your own model or go to another closed model because of accuracy, business relevancy, or just because it's so much work to bring it into uh, the proper level for enterprise usage. You know, I, I'm sure like my kids, a good uh, example, Gary, to ask about um, preparing a meal, we can afford one or two maybe mistakes, right? But if it comes new to, now to shipping, you know, a pharmaceutical and other thing, this need to be uh, much, much on a higher pedestal. So I'm saying open source is the go-to solution, yes, for experiment. I would even take it farther, Shuri. It can be used very safely, I believe, to some use case where it's proved the value. But definitely, we need to constantly evaluate if it's accurate enough, reliable enough for all the use cases we are providing. And there are many good cases for using closed model and also even build your own model if the problem is big enough. And of course, the cost justifies. 
Um, uh, Olivia is going to uh, launch another poll question. And, and so I'll, I'll ask the question of, of you all. And, and maybe we'll start with, with you, uh, Yad. How, how do you see sort of generative AI? We talked about kind of apps and different use cases and, and so forth. But how do you see generative AI sort of fundamentally changing kind of the nature, the structure of enterprise software? Yeah, I think there are three things. First of all, uh, I saw the poll. I can I, I cannot vote because participant cannot vote. But first of all, the interface is a big one. I see paradigm shift there. You just can deploy a whole new, um, sorry, a whole new um, chatbots, right, or AI or interface using questions to interact with all enterprise system. You know, theoretically, you can put these bots on front of SAP, Salesforce, Workday, all the stacks, and just have one Google-like chatbot mm -hmm. to interact with the with the with the software. So the second thing is that it's open the enterprise software for more roles for more users that generate that, that usually are not really interacting with the software. Like when it comes to analytics software today, anyone who generates reporting or generates some sort of analytical insight needs to go through a relatively good training and so forth. Now you can increase the reach for more general population. So more users is also touch enterprise software, which is a dream for CIOs, right, and others to kind of capitalize the investment further. So interfaces, more users will get exposed to analytic recommendation, like Shruti said, and touch the system. And the last point is what we discussed briefly earlier, more features, more capabilities that you can do, use case, guarantee your words, that can generate more revenue and in other ways. And this can be based on new type of automation, or like I mentioned earlier, now automate uh, also compliance regulation. We can see much more use case that can help business to grow, analyze new type of patterns, right? To have better risk mitigation. So interfaces, no new users, and yes, new capabilities. This is how I see the paradigm shift in a very high level. Yeah, I think on I, interface will be key for me. Like the, I think everybody when they saw the first OpenAI uh, ChatGPT site. They were like, oh, this is so cool. It's generating like a, an answer for you, super fast and so on. What was much more blowing my mind was the simplicity of the interface. And one thing that we all forgot and all accepted for years, if you go and do a Google search, it's getting better now. But literally, like in January, you were doing a Google search and search whichever topic what you were getting, like type in top 10 emerging tech. That was my uh, search I, I did. You were getting a top 10, which was actually eight bullet points, not 10, eight. You were getting five ads and a lot of white space on your screen. And you were not really getting the answer. And yeah, that was the way we are searching the web. That's the what we are used to. That interface is going to disappear completely. So I think that the way you see like uh, OpenAI getting you directly an answer, having a conversation, getting data in and out uh, of the system and so on, that is really uh, for me the, the big, big change. Like any software that is built today that is not using a conversational interface will be obsolete or looking like obsolete very soon because it's so easy. Like I'm, I can finally speak with the software, get the information, get a deep dive in a topic in a such a, an easy manner with this conversation, much more than just trying to type exactly the right keywords, avoiding the advertising and trying to find like through a, a wealth of image where uh, is exactly the text I'm looking for. The best example back to, you're, you're going to think like this guy, he just eats food nonstop, but actually I do. Um, it's like a uh, recipe, look for a recipe on the web right now. If you look for a recipe in the web, you go on a site with recipe, you have like five page to get finally to the ingredients. And before that, you had tons of different ads and so on. That That is going to disappear. Like right now, give me the five ingredients to do uh, chili con carne. Boom, you get the answer. It's listed, it's done. And I think that's kind of ease, simplicity, need to come also in enterprise software where you say, hey, give me my top five opportunities. Where should I spend my time today? Boom, you have it. Okay, can you call my customer? Yes, I'm going to do that for you. And so on and so on. That I think is a simplicity that will change everything, at least in my world of application and uh, CRM use case. I think I think you're making the case that just we ourselves, because we're in the midst of it, don't 
can't quite feel how powerful this uh, simplicity of the interface is, which is what has made chat gp the fastest growing app. exactly so I have to say, you know gary uh it's only for now that there are no ads in chat gpt i wouldn't be surprised yeah, the whole team at open AI <laughs> figuring out we have the subscription paid model how soon can we release an ad you know funded model for chat gpt because you have to monetize it they're investing so much money i wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing ads show up and they're trying to figure out the best way to include ads it there. might come I hope it will I'm, not break the interface with advertising. I'm willing to bet anything on it that, you know, um, I mean, I'm at a startup, so I like betting. But, you know, what I see is it's more, um, we're talking a lot about conversational and all of that goes to search. How do you search and retrieve the right information in the enterprise at the right time? But I also see a big opportunity for discovery, right? Because how many times um, do you hear something from a coworker that you're like, wait, why didn't I know about this? And that kind of discovery is also incredibly hard. I think, you know, I go back to Netflix, uh, which has done an amazing job of providing search so you can search. I think they can, again, improve it a lot more. <laughs> that clunky interface where I go type has to go. Alexa works only so well. But the real change in how we work is going to come when we don't have to go to Slack and email and read a bunch of other things to figure out what's really happening in my business. Wouldn't it be great if you had you know, AI really figuring out what is the pulse of the business and giving you your personal quote unquote newsfeed? I mean, if you think about what Facebook did back in the day, I, you know, a lot of my co-founders are from Facebook. So I hear these stories all the time. Back in the day, the newsfeed was something that was generated once a day in the morning and it was a bad system and it didn't have any AI or ML incorporated. Over the last you know, 10, 15 years, it's become very real time and it's incorporated AI, ML to an extent where you open your Facebook news feed and it is serving the relevant ads to you, showing you, again, you, know, you like this um, friend and not that distant cousin, showing you more posts from that friend. So you're doing a really good job of figuring out what you're interested in and bringing you that data. And I can't wait for a world where I come to work every day and I don't have to worry about what do I not know, because that's always top of mind for me. But, you know, I have a lot of information being fed to me based on my role, based on the business context that I care about, based on what's happening in my business today. So then on the areas that I want to ask more questions, I can do drill downs, I can do the conversational back and forth. But first and foremost, give me all the information I need in one place. Help me with discovery. Hey, this deal is at risk. You need to intervene today. Gong is starting to do these kinds of things. It's been integrated with Salesforce, right? Here's a late stage deal where this meeting has been rescheduled three times or in this meeting, they said something negative. You might need to go intervene there. That's the kind of thing that AI tapping me on the shoulder and telling me where to pay attention so I can go in and ask it more questions. Hey, what happened here? What was the background? What's the context? How many meetings have we had? Have we you know, completed a successful POC? What's the deal size? You know, that's the kind of back and forth that you can imagine even in a business context. We'll, uh, there are a bunch of questions here. And uh, so we'll do a lightning round of rapid fire uh, questions and answers. So this is from Michael Scheibel. And this is this addresses the very important issue of kind of cost. So just to paraphrase him, you know, cost of, uh, he says inference, but I'll say serving and inference, uh, training and inference is, is very high. And, and today, Microsoft OpenAI is providing for 1,000 tokens, three, is asking for 3 to 12 cents. But it is said that that is highly subsidized. They are losing money, which is why uh, it's not available to all. Unless your cloud spend on, on Microsoft is significant, you're not getting access to that. So how do you see this uh, playing out? Because, because for, a, uh, for a software vendor like you guys, um, you know, there has to be some way to, for the customer to realize value for, for this cost. Someone has to pay for this. Uh, you know, for a short time, VCs will pay for it, like they did for Uber and Airbnb and so forth. But how do you see that playing out? 
Um, uh, Yad, do you want to start? Yeah, so I'll keep it very short. Of course, first of all, there are constant improvement in methodologies to improve the cost. Of course, the cost is a big thing, right? Like caching and others. I'm not going to talk more about it, but um, I also think there will be a time where the cost will face some sort of a big breakthrough, like happened with blockchain and other technologies where it's going to be dramatically reduced. Um, yeah, but at the moment, I think we are seeing so much value in 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 the right in the in embedding the AI in the application, that it's kind of provide more users and more growth, right? It's also to help to increase the vendor revenue, like like Shruti so and Gary. Customers will pay more for your software? I don't think necessarily they need to pay more or premium. I think you can also sell more software to more people, to more use cases, right? And then license more and use more people using the software at scale. Um, and then you have a relatively um, better correlation between uh, revenue and cost. But definitely cost is still an issue. I'm not going to, to hide it and we need to improve this. But currently we see a lot of interest and, and a huge demand for this kind of use case. So yeah, this is where we're more looking into embedding the application and provide it to more and more people. And then um, we are constantly working on improving the cost in some elements. I said earlier, I'll stop here because we can talk about it the entire day. Um, maybe I'll direct this to one of the others. This is from our friend Jason Sida, who's at Next 47. So he's asking a question where can this is kind of can you kind of combine um, uh, uh, IP? which is can a, can a company kind of take its proprietary information and put it in a, in a LLM or some sort of vector database or something like that and, and combine it with another LLM to create value? I, I would love to answer this one because I actually think that is the only way that you can create value. There is no other way uh, because these things don't exist in silos. It is absolutely impossible for them to exist in islands and then say, oh, we're not going to connect these two. So I think the real answer is absolutely. You have to be able to bring uh, both of these enterprise data as well as this in contact. And this is where, again, you know, what we see you know, with Rockset playing a role here is we already have enterprises indexing all their data to do search and analytics on it. And what you need to do is you also need to bring in vector embeddings and you also need to bring in your uh, LLM so that you pass these uh, embeddings, index them, store them. And the only way to actually generate value is do the kind of search and analytics where you're using metadata, using the filtering, using, again, this is called hybrid. So there's a very much, you know, this is the state of the art in the vector database world. You're using enterprise data, metadata to do filtering, and then you're using vector embeddings and you're using you know, uh, the vector database to do a similarity search on that. But you have to absolutely bring these two in contact. They cannot exist in a silo. Got it. Gary, this next question for you, and then we'll have a last question. So this is uh, one of our founders, actually, Ishwar Priyadarshan is asking, um, you know, we seem to be in an AI Moore's law mo moment where 10x leaps happen almost every two weeks. Why would an uh, what advice would you give to a CIO who says things are moving so fast that they would keep doing small POCs instead of sort of just committing uh, to a product technology? When you're enough, I will tell you. Um... The, when I worked on Web3, when we started uh, on Web3, uh, we, we did multiple blockchain uh, projects, Salesforce, but the la latest one we started, when I started, I had kind of the same as what's happening right now. People were telling me, oh, you need to work with this blockchain and this blockchain and there's this new blockchain and this one is the cool guy, but this one is going the fastest and so on. I think it's very hard to bet and find out who is the best. Um, so keep your partner open, like use a few of them to see really what's the story, are they really better? What's the ecosystem around and so on? Like for example, OpenAI, huge community around it, very interesting on the trust side, maybe harder to, to use. We'll see with the enterprise solution, how is that evolving and so on. So I think first use different suppliers and see what are their, their really their um, weakness and strength. Uh, second, I think 
right now, that's back to easy use case. Like if you want to build a, a virtual assistant that is going to look like a human, that is going to be dedicated for every of your customer, and it's appearing on the screen, doing zero hallucination, having a perfect, uh, uh, you know, view for the for the user and so on, like uh, or form or shape or whatever. Ah, that's going to take forever. It's not going to be easy. You are going to change fifty times of providers. Not making sense. Take something very easy, like speak to your to your business partner, especially as a CIO. It's I think it's very important. Like what what does your organization need right now? A, a very basic uh, example is like if you look at Amazon uh, product description, you would think like product description, like fine, you know what's so important about it and so on. Amazingly enough, the return rate is depending on the product description. So you will have much less return from uh, of the product if you have good images, but also good good product description. So take that. It's an easy use case. It's pretty simple. You can go pretty quickly. You can try different suppliers, see what kind of description you are getting with different prompting and so on. Uh, and then that you can commit because that's a small project. Yes, it might there will, there will be maybe a new LLM coming in two months, three months, maybe a new version of whatever coming. Will it drastically change the way you do product description? Probably not. So that's is a quick win. You can take that. It's the an changes easy, it's between uh, different versions of GPT have been pretty significant. Yes, correct. But the product description probably would be slightly better. Would it be drastically better between GPT 3.5 and GPT 4? Maybe, maybe not. It's it's like, does it require you a huge change of, of your implementation, your solution? Probably not. Maybe it's just called a different version of the API and that's it. So but I think that's, that's the story is to start with easy use case, be agile on it and do quick wins. Don't, don't aim right now at, I need a two year or three year roadmap committing to one supplier for the next five years and so on. That's will, I mean, the, the space is going to change 50 times for the next 12 months. So. Quick wins, do quick wins. Got it. Winding down last question, and there's a kind of few word answer, which is, um, you know, given kind of, uh, uh, you know, the growth of LLMs, do you see kind of LLMs kind of killing SaaS, much like Gary, your company sort of quote unquote killed software. Uh, do you see LLMs killing SaaS and kind of related question, do you see much of the value um, uh, and, and the money being spent by customers shifting towards the LLMs itself? Uh, Shruti, do you want to start? Oh, absolutely not. I'm not one of the SaaS vendors here, so I can speak uh, more neutrally here. I think it'll only change the UI, you know, instead of seeing a UI with boxes and you know drop downs it's just going to change the interface and it's definitely going to change how we interact with software how we interact with SaaS but you see the need for this heavy workflow structured applications that kind of thing the workflow the way you interact again when you say workflows i think what you really mean is the way the human interacts with the software but the workflows on the back end that the SaaS application is actually doing, whether it's SAP ERP systems or whether it's Salesforce or CRM system, I mean, there's a lot of workflow that it's coordinating on the back end for you. I don't see that going away. I see them you know, evolving so that the user interface and how the user interacts with it shifts fundamentally, makes it much easier for the user to interact with it and actually adding even more value, if you will, by getting even more embedded into the users every day. I mean, Slack, for example, is there every second with me, and I can totally see all of these uh, other interfaces getting that way. But I definitely see you know, SaaS at the back end and all the workflows, because SaaS is not just the interface, right? SaaS is so much more. It's the software that orchestrates all our workflows. Jan? Yeah, I don't think it's going to, to kill the SaaS because like Shruti said, you need the tables, you need the process, you need the workflows beneath the thing, right? And this is what kind of can be wrapped by the nice AI interfaces, but the core, you know, the skeleton is something that it's it's mandatory. So yeah, another interaction channel, help productivity, streamline things, but not going to change the need for SaaS applications. 
Daddy, take off your big company hat. Agreed. Um, so no, definitely it's not going to uh, kill SaaS. Um, I think you need data that is proprietary to you. So that's your CRM, for example. You need workflows. How do you serve the customer? How can uh, how are you going to bill, invoice, and so on? All these like all these are workflows that need to exist in a company. They're going to be enhanced. They're going to be changed by the use of AI. Uh, like billing codes, like do I need to still in, still uh, type in billing codes in, uh, when I'm doing invoice and so on? Probably not, but you still need the workflow to send an invoice that is actually making sense for your customer. So I think it's not going to disappear. It's just like making it much more productive and definitely changing the interface more and more. I, I'll disagree with you. I think I think LLMs will have a radical impact on on uh, software as it is today. I really appreciate uh, this has been a great conversation, Shruti, Yad, and, and Gary. I wish we could continue uh, some more. And thank you to the audience for uh, all the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to many of these questions. There were a bunch of awesome ones that we couldn't get to. And thank you, Olivia, for helping host uh, today's event. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Shruti, thank Gary, you. for joining. And then recording will be up on our YouTube channel, uh, hopefully by tomorrow. But have an amazing day. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank and you. Have an amazing day. Thank, yeah. thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.